So, um, Sabina, can you hear me okay? Great, okay, great. Um, our next speaker has had an amazing life. Uh, he's seen so many things, and he's been right in the heart of focal points of U.S. history, which is one of the reasons <laughs> he came to HEO way back in the very early years of HEO. Um, he's an expert in spectral polarimity. Polar, I can't even say it right, I'm sorry. Polar remedy? Polar remedy. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Dr. Andy Skimanich. I hope there are no faults in the system. So give me a nod when you want me to advance your slide. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, visitors, uh, hangers on, and whatever else. We uh, appreciate your presence. I want to say that I hope most of you can do double task. I'm not going to ask for a multitasking, but I'm going to put up slides which I hope you will read while I speak and that you can understand to some extent either uh, channel that's being delivered to you. May I have the next slide, please? These are the four subjects that I'm going to discuss briefly, uh, my work in them and my contribution to HRAO and HRAO's contribution to me and their support. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I've tried to make this as understandable because some of the fields, for example, this uh, art radiative transfer and non-local thermodynamic equilibrium, very arcane subject. And uh, I haven't had, and I'm, I thought I wasn't going to have enough time to try to describe it to you, but since Dick was so kind to give me half of his time, I <laughs> thank you very much, I will perhaps uh, say more than I intended to. In any respect, my earliest uh, interaction with HAO was in 1954. I took my degree at Princeton and was looking for a job. And believe it or not, Walt Roberts, under the instigation of Don Menzel, offered me a position here. Well, but I also had an offer of a position from the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory at the time to work on this very exciting new field, high temperature plasmas, uh, non-equilibrium phenomena, thermodynamics, radio transfer, neutron transfer. And I didn't remember or know about the 52 eclipse and the great burst of non-local thermodynamic equilibrium that took place associated with that eclipse, with the data from that eclipse, from the chromospheric data from that eclipse. <coughs> In any respects, uh, as you might guess, I went to Los Alamos. And I was there for uh, six years, five years. Went off to the University of Rochester for a while. And find out I missed the West. And Walt Roberts came to my aid and offered me another job at HAO. This was in 61. So I arrived in October of 61. When I arrived, I had no, so to speak, irons in the solar physics fire. Excuse the uh, mixing of metaphors in there. In any respect, uh, what I was interested in at the time, um, from a past uh, experience, was the issue of emission lines in stars and emission lines, uh, particularly of calcium, the calcium ion, calcium plus, singly, single electron removed from the ion, so gave you. The astronomers like to label this calcium one, calcium two, calcium three, indicating the different, so to speak, chemical phases of calcium, the different ionized phases of calcium. Well, calcium is a fairly abundant element, and it's very visible at eclipse, for example, it's one of the, in the metallic spectrum of the chromosphere. Now, you get to see the chromosphere. Well, let me back up for a moment. Let me go on to the next slide, in fact. Uh, the next slide shows you uh, the, the whole issue of how do you define a chromosphere. Well, in stars, it's defined by the presence of calcium emission uh, line at, in the blue. Uh, you see this on the right-hand side. 
this is the single line of the K line. And what you have is a photograph along the slit vertically, but there is somewhere a red. Is this, no, is this it? The color top down. OK, uh, wavelength is increasing this way, so you're on the blue side here and the red side there. Uh, you go from the photosphere. You can look down as far as you can see, which is one, one mean free path, and it's uh, the distance to which photons travel before they're absorbed. They usually travel, on the average, one, one mean free path. Uh, so here, you look down one mean free path through the photosphere. But when you get into the absorption line, you begin to, you can't see as far down. So the star gets darker, goes through a minimum. And then in the center of this resonance line, by resonance I mean it's the energy of the photon is close to the energy of one of the internal states of the atom. In fact, close to our transition between two states in the atom. So it's like uh, it takes the pair, and it resonates in that pair and gives you what is called a resonance line. Uh, and in the center are these little bright features that sometimes have wings, bright wings, other times don't. And here you're down in the cool uh, photosphere, probably around 4,400 minimum. And these are the calcium emission knots or emission kernels that if you collapse this so that you see the sun as a star, uh, you'll see it as an emission feature, only under high dispersion. That is, you have to really pull apart the colors to be able to see this. Because if you have low dispersions, like, for example, objective prison spectra, you take a camera with a big uh, entrance uh, lens, put over a quartz uh, prism, small angle prism, and instead of having dots uh, that you look at as the stars, you see little rainbows. Uh, and K-line is quite visible there if it's, if it's uh, in emission. And usually that you only see in the red dwarfs, because the instrumentation uh, in the earlier phases didn't have the ability to see this in the dwarfs, main the G dwarfs. Well, at eclipse, you see this as an emission shell between the disk and the corona. And on the disk, you see them as these reversed features, uh, which, in fact, hail in 1892, well around the turn of the century, the beginning of the 20th century, identify them as features on the sun, bright. They used to call them flocular or bright clouds. They talked about calcium vapors in the sun. Uh, well, Remember, this is the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, I will see something briefly about um, M stars, main sequence M stars. In astronomy, main sequence is now indicated by a Roman numeral 5. And the Roman numeral 3, for example, are giants. Roman numeral 1 and 2 are the supergiants. So they're in the luminosity classification. Anyway, the red dwarfs are about a whole, half a solar mass and about 3,400 uh, the photospheres. May I have the next slide, please? This is a spectra, again, a fairly not as high resolution as the previous one I showed you, of the region of the K and H line, the blue. And on the right-hand side, the spectral types, the, the temperature types, because as you go from uh, the G1 or G2 stars at the very bottom to the M2 at the very top, uh, you're going from, what did I say, 54, 54 5800 to 3400 temperatures. The K line and the H line are both in emission. Now, you can shrink this even further by going to stars, and because you don't have the, 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 as much light to spread out, so you keep it more concentrated. Let's see what I have next. All right, may I have the next slide, please? Here I have a history. Here I have a history of the uh, discussion of calcium emission in stars, and in particularly the association of calcium emission with age. Previously, uh, well, the first ev evidence, in fact, for an age effect in these stars was Del Hay, a Frenchman, who with 16 stars, and you might laugh at the, uh, the number of objects that he studied, but what he found is that if you look at the, and they had spatial, they had mo uh, spatial motions, angular motion, which is called proper motion, and radial velocity, which is two or away from you. And he was able to show that the space motions, particularly motions perpendicular to the galaxy, you have to have enough velocity to be able to go high up above the galaxy. He found that they were all clustered close to the center of the, of the, um, of the disk of the galaxy. And that they had small residual motion. That is, you subtract out the average of the stars, 
This is like having a beehive, a bee cluster, and they're moving in one direction. You take out that velocity, and then you have the little fluttering around inside the cluster, changing partners, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that the dispersion was 17 kilometers per second. This is sort of a typical velocity, st stellar motions. Uh, typical in the sense that you're in kilometers per second, not centimeters or, or something else. And that the old, uh, that the uh, stars that, DM stars that had no emission uh, were much broader spread out. So he says, well, this has got to be an age effect because clusters either were born out of gas clouds, molecular clouds, dust clouds, and this has internal turbulence. And that the older the uh, star is, it was born earlier, and hence it was in a higher turbulent medium when it collapsed, when it formed, when it condensed. And so as the galaxy aged, these turbulences died out through friction and or whatever. And so that was his argument. Well, I mean, the other argument is that these stars, this group of stars, did not collide with enough clouds to lose, uh, to gain energy from the clouds. The clouds were uh, traveling much faster than these stars. Uh, but then Vysotsky and Dyer in 57, I'm sorry, in 53, I keep forgetting my work, in 53 uh, with Vysotsky at the Leander McCormick Observatory in, uh, I hope you're hearing all of this, because I don't want to repeat it. Uh, he found that he could discriminate G stars, dwarf G stars, by certain spectral features. So he classified stars, but he didn't want to be biased by the velocities of these stars, so he invited me down to do the velocity part of the experiment while he did the spectroscopic part of the experiment. So he classified these stars. We have many more stars than uh, Delhaix. And he found out that his group A stars that had this particular feature, or absence of feature, have very small dispersions, 17 kilometers per second. And that the stars that contain the sun had 24 kilometers per second. Well, you might say, well, is that a significant difference? Yes, it is a significant difference. Uh, so at that point, you might say that, well, B stars must very well be the old stars. We didn't know anything about the emission of these stars. So when I came on board here in 61, my first idea was to see if I could find if there were any evidence for emission in the class A stars, the stars where we thought young. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, in 57, Vysotsky and Dyer confirmed Del Delhaye. They found out that the DMEs, they had a much larger sample. So the uh, previous 17 got reduced to 11, and the uh, the DB stars were 11. The uh, older, well, the stars that are without emission were 30. Well, in 63, after doing a, when I arrived, I did a search of the literature of all the catalogs I could find. One of the things I must say is HAO had a magnificent library and a very mag magnificent staff. So I could get things from all over the place, uh, catalogs that weren't even published uh, uh, from authors who were happy to have me use their data and show how important their data was. Uh, I was able to find that the A stars were in fact emission stars and that the B stars were not. So here was another circumstantial evidence for ages for the association of chromospheric intensity with age. Uh, in 62 or so, Wilson came to give us a colloquium at the old armory building on, uh, is it Prospect? Right behind, behind uh, Mackey Auditorium. Uh, we were all there, half of them were meteorologists, the other half were solar physicists. And he was telling us about his study of open clusters. These are loose clusters, not like the globular clusters, which are very tight. And that he found that the younger the cluster, the stronger was the calcium emission. And he was worried that, what, well, what happens in the field? I mean, the only evidence that, was that, that I had was the uh, vysotsky uh stars. Uh, so I had, at that time, I already learned about an unpublished catalog by Strumgren and Perry that had very accurate photometry. So you could really say how bright a star was uh, for its color and, how, and what its temperature was from its color. And that, let me see if, what the next slide is. I think that's the next slide. Yes. Uh, so I told him that, well, why don't you get, uh, why don't I give you or you get uh, copy of the Srumgen Perry catalog and see what, in fact, the main sequence stars are doing in the field. That is, the 
outside, the, outside of con congregations, clusterings. Well, when we plot, the, when he plotted, and he joined, asked me to join him in this uh, procedure, so I went out to Mount Wilson, helped him take some of a photographic uh, uh, spectra of these stars, and I estimates to estimate how intense the calcium emission was. Well, it turned out, and by the way, this bunch of stars, the sun falls over there where I'm indicated, DG2, you can see it there. The, uh, the lower boundary of this uh, band is called the main sequence. This is the very youngest of uh, stars that are already burning hydrogen. They've settled down, they've passed their Titara youth, where they were wild and blowing flares all over the place. Uh, so they're sedate, they're burning hydrogen now in a nice uh, fashion. And stars that have already started appreciably burning their hydrogen begin to move off this lower part of the diagram. They do a loop, something if I can draw one up like this, and then over. So many of these stars up in here are already have part, partly burnt their hydrogen. So you find that all of the bright stars, except for two, and Olin always says that in my observations, I always have two or three that don't obey what I believe. And of course, I publish them, but I don't believe them. <laughs> well, there are reasons. For example, spectroscopic binaries. They may be un unknown spectroscopic binaries, in which case they have two stars instead of one, giving you a, a, a signal. So this was certainly much more proof of the fact that strong emitters class two or three uh, in intensity uh, lie on the zero age main sequence, what is called the zero age main sequence. Well, with this, with this weight of evidence, Olin became very excited about actually building a photometer, building something that was an eye base, something that would count photons for him and give him a numerical uh, digital uh, measure of the strength of the star. So we took two bands on both sides of the uh, two lines on the K, right inside the central region, fed them into a photometer, make, put them together in some fashion or other, and gave me the next, uh, gave us the next figure. This is the plot, again against uh, Strumgren and Perry's color, or temperature, of the average instrumental flux from the set of stars. This was early in the game. There are a lot more stars that were done after this figure was published. This was in 1967. The E is uh, the uh, emission characteristic E for emission is uh, the measure, or the, the now digital measure, is from the bottom envelope uh, up to the very top. That is the strength. Excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. This, for example, gives you the actual, this is the difference, because you do have still light present at the bottom of the K line, or the H lines. This is the this is the temperature of, uh, what was it, 4,400 degrees, the minimum temperature, basically. So you're going to have light there. So what you want is the excess light, the stuff that is put in there by these features on the sun, these uh, congregations. These, By the way, Hale also showed, and I forgot to mention this sooner, Hale also showed that there was magnetic fields associated with these bright chromospheric clustering on the disk of the sun, around sunspots, around uh, uh, what, what are called uh, plage, which in French means sand. It has a sandy appearance on the sun uh, in color. So the issue is now, given these numerical uh, instrumental values, can you calibrate the data and get actual physical? If you're a physicist, you don't care about indices. What magnitude, to magnitude two, magnitude three, that's the, my, like my hearing aid when I turn up each step at a time. So uh, you want physical units. And I found that there was, with the auxiliary data that Olin measured, I could calibrate the data and actually convert it in terms of the luminosity of the star, correct for the, bright, for the color of the star, the temperature. And lo and behold, the next slide, please. I had the data, and the question was, how do you plot it? How do you figure out what the functional form is of the data? From Los Alamos, I learned that there are phenomena called asymptotic behaviors where the time run of things no longer remembers what the initial conditions were or the boundary conditions were. These are called asymptotic behaviors, and they're usually power laws. Well, power laws, when you plot on a log-lock plot, you get a straight line, and that's the easiest curve, easiest way to fit a, a power law. You see this in cosmic ray analysis. You see this in high-energy physics. Well, I did that. I had, by the way, 
not only the Hyades, thanks to uh, the Pleiades, I mean, thanks to Bob Kraft. I had Ursa Major that I found stars in the catalogs and I knew their intensities. Uh, Olin had mentioned, uh, uh, Olin Wilson had measured these. And then I had the Hyades and down here I had the sun. I, knew the I know the age of the sun quite well. The age of the uh, clusters you get from the turnoff point of, from the main sequence. Because as the star begins to burn its hydrogen, the earlier, the more massive stars move off the main sequence uh, earlier than the later stars. So by calibrating where the turnoff point is off the main sequence, you know the age of the cluster. Excuse me. <clears throat> I need. So that's how I came up with this, and I found out when I did a straight line. By the way, I introduced Kraft. Let's see. Let's back up to uh, five. The history. Of, let's back up more. once more. Stop. Go forward. Thank you. So uh, we're at the stage where let's see. In uh, we're at something after sixty-seven. In 67, Weber and Davis uh, created the model of the solar wind, a magnetized solar wind. That is, a solar wind that's embedded in a magnetic field. The solar wind gives you a lever arm that, as the sun rotates and the solar wind blows out matter, it leaves the sun, but it takes away the angular momentum of the sun. So they worked out the equations to govern, govern the... Does this go on and off as I turn? I hope you can hear what I'm saying. Yeah. All right. Uh, so they had a set of equations to govern the, in a simple form, to govern the uh, breaking of the sun of stars, because uh, we believe that other stars are similar to the sun, or the sun is similar to other stars. I don't know which way you want to put it. Uh, so we had a, the equations for, for the deceleration from Reverend Davis. And Kraft in 67 also showed that clusters and field emission stars show that rotation declines with age. So in addition to the chromospheric emission that I was interested in, I decided that, well, I better look at rotation too. And now let's go forward. That's it. No, next one, please. So I also looked at lithium because lithium was a very interesting uh, uh, nuclear fuel. It tends to burn uh, lower temperatures than hydrogen. So there was an issue of is lithium carried down into the burn region, or is lithium not carried into the burn region? Or with lithium carried into the burn region, does it also get mixed back up out again through the convection zone? So uh, I thought maybe it would be interesting to look at lithium as a function of age. So at my age now, I don't know why I was so obsessed with age at that, <laughs> at that time. In many respects, uh, I'm not going to discuss lithium. Uh, D Dave Duncan, who's in the audience, did an excellent job on discussing lithium and its significance. But the, you see that the calcium and the rotation, the, uh, the uh, inverse uh, square root, I dropped the, the, the tenth, uh, hundredth place. I didn't think that was important. Uh, calcium seems to be proportional to rotation. That's what these two equations say in the asymptotic frame. So there's a, some constant of proportionality that converts the calcium variable into the rotation variable. Uh, that means, and since Hale already showed that calcium was related to the magnetic field, and Fraser at uh, in San Diego, what was it, General Dynamics, had done on the disk of the sun, showed that the magnetic field in these features was linear to the intensity of each point in the feature. He found a linear relationship. So I would argue that that means that the calcium si signal is also a magnetic signal, and that the magnetic signal must also be proportional to the rotation rate. Well, when I told this all to Bernard Ernie, you know, we used to did this in the back porch of my house having lunch or dinner or something or other, he said, oh, Oh, OK. He came back several days later. He says, you know, I've just shown that it has to be the square root law. When you plug it into the Weber-Davis equations, making assumptions on what the magnetic, how the magnetic field depends upon rotation, you can solve the equations. And you, so at that point, I opened, well, I really didn't. I should have broken open a bottle of champagne, but I didn't. <laughs> I'll do it tonight. All right. Let me see. Uh, it's. Actually, the, the, this, this result was confirmed by Doug Soderblom in a very excellent paper. Uh, and I recommend, if you're interested in looking at 
a beautiful analysis. Uh, we recommend his paper to you. Well, the next thing on my job list was, uh, let's go on to the next slide, please. The next uh, thing was radio transfer and non-local thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, through the past, uh, the uh, emission coefficient, this has to do with now the creation of radiation and its propagation through space. And in fact, you might ask yourself right now, there is energy, radiant energy in every little square box in this room. And your eyes uh, uh, absorb some of that, and that's what you see as light. So the question is, how can you calculate the density of, of photons, of radiation, here, here, and there? Well, you have to, the sources are up there. In the case of the sun, the sources are down below. It's the radiant heat coming upwards. And so how far does it propagate through? Well, that's called radiative transfer. And it's basically called a Boltzmann equation. Some of you have heard of Boltzmann equations. The equation of transfer is a Boltzmann equation for the radiation field. It's a function of spatial variables, three, and momentum variables, three, which in astronomy converts to direction, the direction of the momentum, this is the angular part of the, and then the frequency, which is the energy part, or the momentum part, because energy in photons is the momentum times the velocity of light. Well, this is new. I didn't intend to introduce this, but since Dick gave me enough time, <laughs> like, how, what time do I have? OK. <laughs> uh, well, anyway. Uh, Grant sent me a letter in 65 while I was working on uh, DG stars and uh, working with uh, Oland that he claimed that he found that there was a fundamental flaw in the theory of, uh, oh, but I didn't get to say to you, in non-LTE, you have to also worry about the population of the atoms. That is, you have to know where, how many atoms have an electron in this energy level or how many electrons in this other energy level, because the difference in emission it depends upon the number in the upper level, and the absorption depends upon the number in the lower level. So you have two equations, the equation of transfer and the population equation. And in the case of a two-level atom, that's a simple uh, single equation that you can solve uh, in closed form. Well, with that, uh, uh, the fact was he says that the two-level atom and uh, the solutions, the, that is, the transfer solutions of the transfer equations are in error. And he invited me to come to Munich because he had this exciting new thing, way of looking at the problem that would give us a lot of work in the next 10, 15 years. So I didn't have to worry about continuing to work at HIO. I had built in <laughs> this. Anyway, I went to Munich, and I found out, after studying several days, uh, uh, convincing Grant that he was wrong, because he had convinced Jean-Claude Piquet that he was right, I finally found a hidden in somewhere in there a, a flaw that, in fact, invalidated his argument. But in doing all of this analysis, I found out that he was using the energy equation for the transfer and not the actual transfer, not the with primitive Boltzmann equation function, but integrals of the Boltzmann function, the energy equation for the ration field. And that happens to be an integral equation that is much easier to handle than the solution, the integral equation for the equation of transfer, for the Boltzmann equation. So I convinced him that this must be the way we have to do further problems in the two-level atom. When we came back, he got Buck Fry from, by the way, HAO in those times had a computer group that was actually doing programming. It was the applications group, uh, computer, and uh, we were able to get Buck Fry out of that group, and he, we went through, he derived the numerical form. You can change an integral equation into a matrix equation, and some of you may know what matrices are. There, there's a fancy way of, of manipulating uh, two-dimensional quantities. And well, lo and behold, we had a beautiful operating algorithm. It was convergent. It was stable. And we found, through a number of years, a whole series of papers on the H and K emission, my baby. <laughs> well, finally, uh, uh, I got into other things. and. Um, so I think I'm finished with that. Let's move on to the next slide. That's got to be. OK. I always tell people that when you talk about things, try to define them in a way as some people can, most people can understand. Stokes polar polarimetry, Stokes variables. Well, first of all, you have to realize that, the electro, that light is an electromagnetic field. And as it's propagating along, the field is oscillating transverse to the direction of propagation. 
So when you look at the screen, pretend light is coming into your eye from the screen, and you're looking at the electric vector, and that's a vector that operates on electrons, uh, whereas the magnetic field operates on twisting electrons and not changing their energy. So the electric field is doing some orbit as a wave. And imagine that you have a wave train, some number of oscillations long. It's not infinitely long because the bandwidth is not zero associated with that wave, with that oscillations. Uh, so this wave pane passes through the screen, and its vector rotates. And you can look at the tip of the vector, and you find out that, in general, it's, a, it's an ellipse. In, in physics, this is called ellipsometry, the measurement of the polarization ellipse. Well, an ellipse is governed by three numbers. The semi-major axis, the electric field magnitude there, the semi-minor axis. And that doesn't look like a 90 degrees. It was on my drawing, but this was distorted. Uh, and with these uh, two magnitudes and a position angle. So it means you have to introduce a coordinate frame. And I drew one for you, east, west, north, south. When you're up in the sky, sometimes you use longitudes or latitudes or right ascensions or declinations. But you better tell people what your coordinate axis is. Otherwise, they don't have a reference frame. They don't know what phi is. Then. And if you take those three quantities, you can make four out of them. You can, first of all, you have to square them because they're, if they're electric fields and you want energy. They're amplitudes. You want the square, the energy. And so the first quantity is the intensity. A squared plus B squared. That says how much energy is in the beam. The photon frequency, in other words, uh, h nu times it. Then there's the difference between the between the sum of the squares, and there's a projection factor. The position angle comes in. That's q and u. That's the linear polarization part of the ellipse. But there's one more left. There is something which is the product of a and b, because you would have cross cross products in there. That, by the way, just for those of you who love applied mathematics, turns out to be proportional to the area of the ellipse. Pi times AB is the area of the ellipse. You have to multiply it by 2 over pi to get the actual uh, circular polarization magnitude. But there's also a sign associated with that, whether it's the vector is rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. Now, so the last three quantities, linear polarization and circular polarization, V, I will be talking about a little further on. And there is a difference in HAO between those of us who do circular polarization once upon a time. Now we're doing both, the Stokes vector. But at the beginning, like Gordon Newkirk, he did uh, linear, scatter polarization, linear polarization of the prominences. And he found out, he confirmed what was found out in Europe, that they're linearly polarized. And they're polarized not because of the Zeeman effect, but they're polarized because of the resonant scattering. And you see this in your daily life. You see reflections off pounds of water. You know that it's polarized because when you change your head, your glasses, as you're tilting in the plane, uh, you see the fluctuation in intensity. Well, that was the Gordon School. Uh, then I got into involved into the magnetograph uh, Stokes School. So you have these three quantities. If you have many photons, now I only have not only a single train passing through, but I have a number, quite a number, in fact, a rainfall of photons coming through. You have to average, you have to sum all of, all of these negative and positives. And sometimes they all sum to zero, except for the very first one, the energy. That's unpolarized radiation net unpolarized radiation. But now you make it have a persistent component that gives you rise, that doesn't cancel out, and you have then partial polarization, net polarization in the system. Each photon has its own, but the whole system is now uh, has a net polarization. All right, may I have the next slide, please? Uh, the beginning of the uh, circular analysis was Hal Zirin's visit to, let's see, how much time do I have? I still have some time. Uh, let me go through this as quickly as I can. In 61, or he came back from uh, Crimea, set up with Bob Lee and Dave Rust. This is the personnel part of my talk. Uh, and and uh, Joe Rush, I don't think Joe is here, but he may be here. I may not have seen him. Uh, Use the magnetograph, which is a two-slit device that looks at the two sides of the line. And when the line splits because of the Zeeman effect, there's an unbalance, and they can find out where they can balance out and know what the splitting of the line is. From the splitting, they know the magnetic field. So in 65, Rust wrote his thesis on uh, the hydrogen bomb or alpha line. They presumed that it was a Zeeman effect, but it, uh, it could also be a resonant scattering effect out of uh, prominences. Then Tamberg Hansen took over when Zirin went out to Mount Wilson. 
And with Bob Lee and Jack Harvey, they did then uh, analysis of them. They put in a better slit. Uh, they had a, a variety of changes. And uh, Jack was able to measure the helium D3 line and analyze it in his 69 uh, PhD thesis. The low field values uh, one should were suspect because it wasn't clear that it was a Zeeman effect. They could not see the actual shape of the line. Well, may I have the next slide, please? By the way, the background was, as you've already seen, uh, climax. Stokes Mon uh, started with Jacques Becker's, I think it was the visitor here at the time, who designed linear polarization analysis is very easy. You just take, get good polaroids. But with circular analysis, there is no circular polarizer. There are molecular uh, biological uh, molecules that are left-handed or right-handed, but we don't know how to stick them together. OK. So let me go on. Uh, it has all these various features. Uh, it's linear, it's very accurate, and it gives you the actual profile of the line. May I go on to the next slide, please? This is the, and on to the next. It was here at this big dome facility, on to the next one. Uh, here's Jack, uh, here's uh, uh, Tom Bauer struggling uh, with this monstrous, as you know, as I said, it's a complicated, it's, uh, uh, Stokes polymers are complicated devices. All right, let me go on to the next. It operated to 78. We got better detectors, better other uh, technological advances. Oh, here's a result out of Stokes 1. You see I, Q, U, and V. V has this sign change, which goes from a plus magnitude of 6 down to minus 6. So it's circular on one side. It's rotational right-handed or left-handed on one side and the other. And the linear, you can tell that you're not at the position angle uh, your reference frame is not at the, with zero position angle for the ellipse. Uh, the spot data like this was analyzed by Joe German in 79. May I go on to the next slide, please? Perhaps I'm going too fast for you, but please come back afterwards. Well, with newer instrumentation again, with this exciting, these kinds of results, particularly this uh, observations of prominence with Stokes 1, showed us that the V signal was not a Zeeman signal. Uh, here are the personnel involved. Haus, uh, Einhauer left, and Haus became involved, and then Querfeld, and so on. There we had two inversion schemes, one for the Hanle uh, depolarization for prominence measurements. The other is for disk observations. I need another. Next slide. So here's Stokes 2. There is a young David Elmer. I don't think that's Lou House back there. I don't recognize who that is. It is Lou House? <laughs> OK, I didn't realize he had curly hair at that time, to be honest with you. Is that you asleep? No. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, but actually, Stokes ended, started in June of 79. It ended in October of 80, the observation, Stokes too. And in the annual report, it said the failure of the diagnostic inversion. Well. Grant buttonholed me in the hallway at some time and said, look, you better look at this inversion scheme and see, see what's happening in there. Well, uh, Leitz joined me in doing that. And in 87, we came out with a new inversion method. And we did a spot two analysis that's published in 89. So with this, with this uh, new uh, inversion method, the system was go. We had the technology. The advanced Stokes polarimeter started. And I'm going to let. Uh, who comes after me? Uh, Bob, no, I'm not after me. Uh, Bruce Lights, this, this late this afternoon, will continue with the advanced program. I was involved in that heavily. But uh, one other slide. Uh, oh, I'm not, I want to discuss this. Uh, but I wanted to mention that the phantom of the uh, observatory is Steve Jackson. Steve Jackson had a dream uh, in in 68-69, uh, it was at Princeton. He was working on the internal structure of stars. Uh, Osterreicher's program was doing polytrope models. This is models where you assume the solution of the energy equation. Steve thought he could put in the Schwarzschild method and do the actual energy equation. And it took him all that number of years to finally succeed here at HAO. But he was in and out of HAO, supported by contracts, supported by other people's uh, monies. Anyway, one more slide. And I thank these people. Bruce, in fact, gave me some of the slides which I doctored for my purposes. So thank you very much.
if there aren't questions, they weren't uh, doing uh, duo tasking. <laughs> Uh, just a minute. Uh, hi. I'm interested uh, in the history. What was the nature of the collaboration between stellar astronomers and solar physicists uh, in the 60s? Uh, well, I don't know how many more were, uh, were involved in the collaboration. I was certainly one of those. But how large that group is, I don't know, frankly. I, I didn't take a look. Uh, well, there were some people who worked on, uh, well, I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question, but I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Dick, you had a question. Uh, I do notice and conclude that as you age, your luminosity doesn't go down. <laughs> well, that's typical of hydrogen burning, right? You brighten as you get redder and redder, right? Thank you for that. Too. One question, one more from Art. Hey, Andy. Uh, I was just going to say, your, your question oh, about stellar and uh, solar, back in the 60s at least, it was together. Uh, in NSF and NASA, there was no separation at all. Uh, in fact, I got my PhD on early B stars and then got a postdoc working for Andy here. All of a sudden, I, I didn't even know the difference between a prominence and a flare at that time. <laughs> I hope I did justice to all those people that I've listed in there. If I've left anybody out, uh, please accept my apologies. Thank you again. Thank our speaker again. Thank you.